Get seated on my throne, see. <laughs> you got to preach from a throne. Not many guys get to do that. Wow. This is quite a, this is quite a setup. I like this. Really appreciate your pastor in his heart. God give you a good man. Amen. Love him and support him and, and be as forgiving to him. My congregation has been so forgiving to me. How many of you do stupid things? Now, some of you are not being honest. Uh, there, there just isn't anybody that doesn't in life do stupid things. That includes preachers. And the thing that has been must, the saving grace of my ministry is I have had a congregation that has just been so forgiving and kind to me. And that makes a huge difference in life. You ought to be that way with one another, too. Deacons make mistakes, too. Sunday school teachers, everybody, 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 <laughs> listen, everybody does stupid and foolish things. Isn't that true? Yes. And where would we be if we were called into account for, for all of the stupid and foolish things we ever did? We'd, we'd be hard off, you know, it just would not be good. So, so love him, be forgiving, supporting, and, and be very kind. When I went to San Francisco 45 years ago, I had a dear deacon uh, he, he could make suggestions to me about places I needed to change without me even, no, even knowing he'd done it. He was sweet and kind and di diplomatic. I don't know how he did it. He was so helpful to me. As a pastor, we pastors need some insights sometimes about things. And he was able to give me some insights w without chewing my hide off and, and doing all the things that most people do when they give you the insights you need. Uh, so, um, don't take him to the woodshed, take him to the kindness place, feed him a nice steak dinner, and just make, make some suggestions, kindly and graciously. Love the, just love him to death, stand by him and do everything you can to encourage him. Tell him you're praying for him. And uh, that, that'll mean just a whole lot. And now, by the way, he can't do anything for this church that his dear wife doesn't make possible. Did you hear me? Yeah. And any time you honor her, I'm going to place the Ennis Hex on you. <laughs> I have an Ennis Hex. Any time you honor him, if you don't honor her, I'm placing the Ennis Hex on you. <laughs> I'm serious about that. My dear wife is home with the Lord now, but what, what a, she loved my ministry. She, she, she didn't just tolerate She loved my ministry. And she gave her life to my ministry. What a blessing she was. She, she wanted the ministry to go on, and when she got sick, she said, I don't want to get in the way of your ministry. She, got, she had lung cancer. And I, I looked at her and said, now look, right now you are my ministry. She didn't want me taking time away from the ministry. I said, you are my ministry. So just, just value all the life around you. Just value it. The, the, the greatest treasure of this church are the lives of the people here today. You are the treasure of this church. Just don't, don't forget that. Don't forget that the saints are God's treasure. Um, I don't know how I could be a treasure to God, and if you're honest, you don't either. But the fact of the matter is we are. We are. That, that, that you might know the, the wealth of the inheritance that God has in his saints. That was one of Paul's prayers. So, so you, you need to just treasure one another and, and just treasure the heart of people. And look beyond, listen, look beyond some of the stupid things that people do. I'm just talking frankly with you now. Look beyond some of the stupid things that people do and see their heart. If you saw the heart, you wouldn't think and feel the way you do sometimes. See? So, so just look at the heart if you can. Just love the saints. One of the things that really blessed my ministry was the time I realized that, that, that I was supposed to love the saints under my care, my, the people of my church, I was called to love them, uh, not because I liked them, but I was called to love them because God loved them. And if God loved them, I was responsible to love them. Am I coming through? If God loves them, then we are supposed to love them for God's sake, yes? Not because we like it or enjoy it all the time. 
and maybe I'll get to this in the message today, but your ministry is going to be limited by the amount of suffering you're willing to do for the sins of other people or because of the sins of other people, not in an, not an atoning way, okay? If you won't suffer for the sins of others, your ministry is, you don't have any ministry because you will ultimately suffer for the sins of other people if you minister. People will do things, they'll do hurtful things, they'll, there are all kinds of things go on. Some is intentional, very rarely is it intentional. Most of the time it's not intentional. And so, so there's a cost to doing ministry, but there's a tremendous blessing that comes when you do it. And when you do it under the conditions under which we have to do it. Uh, to um, live in love with the saints above. Oh, that will be glory, but to live in love with the saints below. Now that's another story. <laughs> oh, my. So, so anyway, um, uh, let's see, I've got to keep you awake, don't I? Or, uh, do I do the benediction five minutes? Is that how I do it? Anybody, anybody here, if you're from the Orient, um, you know what durian is. Anybody here, here about durian? Yeah. If you, some of you know, some of you don't know what durian is. It's the stinkiest fruit that's ever been devised by, by the imagination of God. <clears throat> In Singapore, you're, it's illegal to carry durian on the bus with you because it will so offend other people. It, it, it instigates that, that up-chucking thing that, uh, I mean, they really, really stink. Anybody here know what Limburger cheese is? Limburger is to cheese what durian is to fruit. It stinks. You wonder how in the world anybody, anybody could, could, could like Limburger cheese. And uh, so, so let me try to tell you the story about Limburger cheese. This, uh, this lady uh, uh, had a problem with her husband. She would come to church and 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 um, and and she would um, um, uh, sit there with him, and, and he, he would go to sleep every Sunday. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was the snoring. <laughs> so not only would he go go to sleep, but he would snore. Excuse me a minute. No, I guess this is going to be okay. This 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 seat wants to turn around a little bit. Let me reposition something here. I don't know if it'll work or not. Okay, let me try it. Okay, so anyway, so she was, this happened Sunday after Sunday, and she was so embarrassed, she called the pastor, she said, I've got to have an appointment with you. She said, and so she had her appointment, she said, Pastor, you've got to help me. You know what happens every Sunday morning when you preach, he goes to sleep and he snores, and she said, I'm going to quit coming to church. I cannot take the embarrassment anymore of my husband falling asleep during your sermons. And he said, okay, he said, here's a plan. You go home this week and you go to the grocery store and you buy a little, just a little piece of Limburger cheese, okay? And you put it in a Ziploc bag and you put it in your purse. And Sunday morning, you see him starting to nod off and go to sleep. You take a little pinch of that Limburger cheese and you rub it in his mustache. <laughs> and he said, that'll keep her awake. So that's the plan. So she goes, she gets her Limburger cheese, put it, puts it in a Ziploc bag, and Sunday morning comes. And the pre preacher's up there preaching and just having a good time, and his head begins to nod. She said, here it goes. So she reaches in her purse, opens the Ziploc bag, takes a little pinch of the Limburger cheese, puts it in his mustache. And just about 30 seconds later, his hands went up in the air. And he cries out, hey, Mabel, get your feet off of my pillow. <laughs> How's that for a good one? And then the story about the, the church planter, the church, young church, he was a church planter in Texas, he loved horses. And I mean, he loved the racing kind of horses. I have a friend in Utah that really knows how to breed horses and do things. And, and he decided, well, if he's going to be a church planter, he's got to make money on the side. So, so, so he got himself some good breeding stock and, and, and he would get these beautiful horses, break them and train them. And then he would sell them for good money, good 
big bucks. And this enabled him to do his church planting ministry, and they always had enough money to pay their bills and pay their rent and keep the church going. So this fellow came over to buy one of his horses, and I mean, it was a beautiful stallion, just an absolutely beautiful horse. And he said, now look, there's one thing about this horse you've got to understand. This horse is a Christian horse. And if you say giddy up, the horse won't know what you're talking about. You have to say, you have to say praise the Lord. If you don't say praise the Lord, the horse won't go. That's how you get the horse to go. And he said, when you want him to stop, you don't say, whoa, you say, amen. So if you don't say amen, he won't know what you're, what you're talking about. So you just got to remember that. You got a Christian horse here. So he gets this horse home, and he's got this huge ranch. And, and so he gets on his stallion, and, and he tells him, giddy up. The horse just stood there. Giddy up. Just stood there. Oh, he said, praise the Lord. Well, the horse, horse started walking. He said, praise the Lord again. Started trotting. Praise the Lord. He started galloping. He said, praise the Lord. And I mean that. How, that horse was like a streak of lightning. That was a beautiful racing horse. And, on he, and he forgot where he was because he was coming to the head, to, to the edge of the precipice, the cliff. And he was enjoying this so much. He looked at him. Oh, wow, wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The horse just keeps going. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, he said, amen, amen, amen. And they skidded to a hall just about a foot or two from the edge of the cliff. He says, whoo praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd share those profound stories with you. Just, just to kind of lighten things up for just, just a minute or two, uh, just to get our circulation going just a little bit, if, if I might do that. I was sharing with some of the teens here that one of the great blessings of my life was that the Lord enabled me to figure things out as a teenager. And I wasted virtually none of my life. Absolutely amazing how good God's been to me. And this is a day of technology. This is a day when, when, when we are all enamored, all enamored with, with all kinds of technology. Someone here is going to take biology and, and biological figures, just fields, just all the different fields of science are just, just almost going crazy with new technology. My son is in the hospital. Uh, with leukemia and, and, the, and the various procedures they're doing with him. It's unbelievable what they're doing with the technology of the day. Absolutely amazing. Even when my wife had cancer, the, 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 the pro progress in technology and the field of medicine and, and, the, and just everything, automobiles, the computers, the, all of these worlds, the technology is just advancing unbelievably along the way. And, and so the, the, one of the problems we have I want your attention for just a moment here, please. One of the problems we have is we, our hearts and minds have been captured by the technology of the day, but they've not been captured by God. That's a huge problem. I want you to turn, please, to Romans chapter 11. Actually, turn to Romans 12, and we'll back up a couple of verses there. Romans 12. We are so enamored with the technology of the day that, that, that God rarely captures our imagination. I want to talk to you about God and technology a little bit. If you will, go to Romans 11, verse 33. Just back up from 12, about three verses. Are you there? Romans 11, verse number 33? Yes. Okay. Notice the third word. What is the third word there? Depth. Depth. And we could, we could spell that D-E-E-P-S. Oh, the deeps of the riches. Both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
Now, anybody know how deep the ocean is? I looked it up on Google. The, the, the Mariana Trench is 36,201 feet deep. I don't think anybody's ever been to the bottom of that. That is 6.8 miles deep. And what he takes here is the deepest thing that you've got in the human mind and imagination. And he says, this is the mind of God. This is the wisdom of God. The big problem we have, and I saw Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 on your screen upstairs, Trust in the Lord. Well, what do you mean trust in the Lord? Trust in a God whose wisdom can't be measured, can't be comprehended. His wisdom goes beyond anything we can imagine. The greatness of his mind. Oh, the deeps of both the riches, the wisdom, the knowledge of God. He talks about his judgments, and he says they are unsearchable. Well, let me give you the theological definition of the Greek definition here. It means impossible to search out, unsearchable, unfathomable. The mind of God can't be searched. It can't. Listen, someone talked to me this morning after the service. Where did God come from? Your mind can't wrap itself around that. God is uniquely uncreated. Everything else is time and space, but God is not time and space. He transcends it. There's no beginning with God. But your mind can't conceive that. That's inconceivable. Explain that to me, please. And if your God can be explained, your God is as little or smaller than you. Think that one through. Okay? So... His, his judgments are unsearchable. They're unfathomable. And his ways past finding out, that means they are inscrutable, not to be tracked out or detected. They're unsearchable, impossible to understand, inscrutable. His ways are inscrutable. You, you see, you and I ask the wrong question all the time. Why God? Why God? Why God? No, no, no. Don't go there. Your brain won't, won't, won't contain it. You're, you're talking to a God who has a wisdom beyond anything you can comprehend. He knows eternity. He knows outside of eternity. He knows space and outside of space. He knows everything from before the beginning to after the ending. Everything is comprehended in the mind of God, put together in one large picture. And then, then we want him to explain that to us. Now, the only why we should ask is not a why, but what, Lord, do you want of me in this? See? What do you want? What do you want? So, all oh, the deeps of the riches, that's a wealth. This is a wealth you cannot comprehend. Wisdom and the knowledge of God, unsearchable as judgments, as ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord and who's been his counselor, his advisor? I have a kind of a joking way to explain prayer. Do you know what prayer is? Prayer is the means by which we advise God. <laughs> so that he will know what he needs to do. And when he doesn't take our advice, we accuse him of not answering prayer. That's too true. Who's been his counselor? Who, who's been his advisor? God didn't call you up and ask you if you could get cancer. God didn't call you up and ask you if you'd have an accident or a death in your family. God didn't call you up and ask your advice on that. God didn't call your pastor up and ask if he wanted the COVID. For his own divine purpose and reasons that nobody could understand even today, if he, if he gave them, he did things for reasons that go beyond our capacity to understand. And that's why when you try to figure life out, hear me, young people, you try to figure life out without God's word, you can't do it. It's not possible. It's not possible. So then we have a tremendous verse in verse number 36. 
For of him and through him and to him, from of God, through God and to God, is our what? All things, everything, everything. To whom be glory forever, amen. All right? Now, let's take the Greek prepositions. All right? For of him, that means out from him. Out of God, out from God, which means God is the source of everything. I'm going to give you three words. Write them down. It's, it's a good outline of this verse. He is, number one, our origination. Out from him. He is our origination. The next word is through him. And that's the Greek word through. Same preposition in the Greek text. Through him. Now that means he is our continuation. Paul said in Mars Hill, in him we live and move and have our being. He is our life breath. When God says no, you're stop, your heart stops and that's the end. He's our origination. He is our continuation. We have no sustenance without him. Life continues through him. It comes out of him. It goes through him. And then thirdly, into is the Greek preposition, into him. It comes out of him. It continues through him. And it goes back into him. That is the meaning of your life. You got it from God, you keep it through God, and you, it ends in God. So who ought to be the central focus of your life? Okay? Out of him, through him, into him are all things. He is my origination, he's my continuation, and he is my consummation. He has those three things. Okay? What a God! He's not something sitting on the shelf. He's uniquely uncreated. He's uniquely infinite. He's uniquely triune. And he's uniquely holy. These are the controlling attributes of God. And so, in Ephesians, we read another amazing, absolutely amazing statement. By the way, let's... let's, let's um, Pause for just a moment here, okay? Do you have a cell phone? Okay. A lot of technology in that little thing. Your cell phone has more computing power than the computers that were on board the first space, mis space mission to the moon. The first space mission to the moon, the first rocket that went to the moon, had a computer that didn't have but just a fraction of the computing power that your cell phone has. This is amazing. I ask, my, I ask my cell phone, how do I get to Riverside Baptist Church? Take this street and this street and this street and this street. If you want to go another route, it's a minute more, a minute less, whatever you want to do. And it gives you all of the... And I go on to Google and I say, where's the deepest place in the ocean? And it gave me that information. Just gave, all I do is ask the phone. <laughs> but hear me, hear me, especially you young folks here. Did you know that one human brain has more computing capacity, one human brain? I want to get you off your reverence of this technology that we have today. One human brain has more computing capacity than all of the world's supercomputers put together. More processing power. One human brain. When you hold your cell phone up, you are stone age when it comes to technology. What God made in you so far exceeds what man has ever devised. And we've got this new quantum computing that's coming up. Anybody know about that? There's a new thing called quantum computing that's coming up now, see? And that's just going to multiply the, the processing power of what we already have. But that is still going to pale in comparison to God's computing power. This is amazing. And as I mentioned in the service this morning, 
When I was in high school, they taught about 100 galaxies, and then that went up, and a few years ago, they got up to 2 billion galaxies. I said, wow, 2 billion galaxies with 10 billion stars, 10, 15 billion stars per galaxy. Wow. And now they're up to th two to three, and they backed off a little bit right now, but even those who are born-again Christians in the scientific world, who are not evolutionists and not trying to prove all of this nonsense of evolution, even they will agree that they're between two and three trillion. Now what is a trillion? It's a thousand billion. What's a billion? It's a thousand million. So you've got two trillion galaxies up there. You tell me that evolution did this? You have got to have a lot of faith. Who is this evolution? No intelligence? Nothing plus time? Plus random chance? Equals everything? Don't try to sell that bill of goods to me. And that is exactly the scientific formula for evolution. It doesn't work that way. So now, let's come down, let's come down, come down to earth just a little bit more about this, all right? So I read that every star has a name. They're numbered. Every star has a name. What is a name? Are you still awake? Yes. Don't go to sleep on me here. Every star has a name. What does name mean? Name means identity. What does identity mean? Identity means specific individual Design and purpose is what produces identity, okay? Every one of these trillions of galaxies, all the stars in these trillions of galaxies, has a name, divinely appointed purpose, individually. God did not create the stars to be a mass. He created them as individual stars. And furthermore, it says not one of them is missing. So what kind of a mind does God have that can create a universe like this and keep up with everything in it with divine purpose? Put them in their, put them in their orbits and put them in their galaxies and, and all of this is, is a, it's a universe. It's not a random verse like evolution says. Uni evolution doesn't have a universe. It has a random verse, a random chance verse. We all know we're in a universe. This is not random. This is the heart and mind of God. All right, you still with me? Yes. Next step. Next step. When all of this was in the designing stage and before anything of this existed. Now again, I love John, John's Gospel chapter 1 concerning Jesus Christ who is the Word. All things came into existence by him, and apart from him, nothing that exists has come into being. That's what the Greek text reads. And then I go to Ephesians, and I read this. God has chosen us in Christ. God has chosen us in Christ before before the foundation. Now, what is the foundation? It's the first thing that gets laid. So before the beginning of the beginning, you, are you with me? Before the beginning of the beginning, God chose us in Christ. Now, stay with me. That means that, that, means that we already existed then in the heart and mind of God. Individually, not collectively. We're not the product of a biological accident between our mother and father. However, that may have taken place. We are the product of the heart and mind of an almighty God that had this in place before the beginning of the beginnings. And he knew us by name. Which means there's not a one of us here that, 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 that is without specific design and plan and purpose in the heart and mind of Almighty God.
Wow. That's one of my favorite expressions. What a God. What a God. What a plan. I'm not an accident going somewhere to happen. Like the evolutionists say I am. The value of my life has nothing to do with what people think of me. My nationality, my extraction. I'm Scottish and German. I had nothing to do with that. Nothing in the world I can do to change that. I have blue eyes. I can't change that. My skin is, well, the sun makes a little bronze, but it's mostly white and pale. That's why the Indians called us pale face. I mean, I have nothing to do with that. That's not my fault. God planned that. God planned that. That's what he wanted me to be. He planned my parentage. He planned my emotional makeup, my mental makeup and mental capacity. All of the capacities that I, and propensities in life that I have began their existence in the heart and mind of God. Are you soaking this in? You quit believing lies about yourself that you're not the right person born under the right circumstances in the right time and if things had just been different. No, 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 no. You weren't born in the, you weren't born in the wrong place. You weren't born in the wrong age and time. Everything about your life is right. Your parentage is right. Regardless of what it is. Whether you understand it or not, it's right. And if you, will, if you will resolve this, that, that, that in the heart and mind of God, God didn't make a mistake about you, which many of you think he did. If only I could be like somebody. No, no, don't ever go there. That's wicked. God didn't intend for you to be like somebody else. God never intended that. God intended for you to be like you are. You're exactly what God wanted. Okay? And if we can get this resolved, it will help us enormously. One of the greatest benefits in my ministry was the day I woke up. And I used to admire great preachers. And I said, if I could just be like this great preacher, or like this great preacher. And I said, I'll never be like this great one and like this great one. And one day I was sitting, it was in Yucca Valley in my office, and I was sitting there and, and the Lord just opened my heart and mind and said, now look, if God wanted you to be that preacher, he would have made you that preacher. And he didn't want you to be that preacher. And he didn't want you to be that one. He wanted you to be a preacher by the name of David Ennis. I said, okay, Lord, that's fine. And I started enjoying being who God made me to be. Wow. And may I say, when you start enjoying being who you are, everybody in your world would enjoy you more than they do now, too. I'm, I'm serious. People who are unhappy about themselves live in an unhappy world. Does it make sense to you? And those things you don't like about yourself, you look at God and was, was God stupid? Did God do it right? Did, did, did God make you wrong? Did God not have wisdom? Did he not know what you should be and what you should be made like? Did he, did he think you should be like somebody else? Huh? Really not. And when you, when you come to realize, it took me a long time to figure this out, so don't be embarrassed. Just don't be embarrassed if you haven't got it all figured out. I haven't got it all figured out yet either. But before the foundation of the world, I existed in the heart and mind of God, and he included me in his plan of redemption. And I'm not going on this election stuff. That, that's for the theologians, the theologians that don't have any better sense than to do things they shouldn't do. <laughs> so, 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 so anyway, um, um, th th this changes my perspective on life, does it not? I didn't arrive here to, to, to get the American dream. That's not what I'm living for. God will give me benefits and blessings. I'm to work. If I do what God tells me to do, I'll make some money. If I do what God tells me to do, I'll manage my money. If I manage my money, I'll accumulate some, some form of wealth somehow. And then if I do it right with God's glory, I'll tell you a little bit else, a little later, what we'll do with this thing, okay? So what I want, or the question I want to ask is this. Why? Why do you exist? What is the reason for your personal existence? 
Why did God create you? Why? Why do you exist? Okay? Why do you exist? How do you explain that? Okay? So let me move along here. We have an example in, in our Lord Jesus Christ. I have often wondered, do, do you listen to some of these preachers that have 20,000 people in their congregations, these health and wealth preachers? These, like I told you this morning, they, God is a big divine ATM machine where you go to get all that you need to, to, to get your dreams fulfilled in life. I, once in a while, I, I look at them at, in amazement. And I said, what, what would Jesus have done if he went to their congregation? Now, Jesus didn't live this way. Why, did, why, why has God given us our personal existence? Why do we exist? Well, Jesus explained it by his example. What did Jesus do? Did he come to get everything he could get? Why did he come into this world? Well, first of all, if he, if, if he were like the average Christian in philosophy, he never would have left heaven in the first place because you don't go to the mission field when there's no promise of anything but suffering and poverty. Come on, help me. We have a problem in our churches today. And the problem is we don't have a Christ-like mentality. Parents don't. We try to get young men out on mentorship in San Francisco. And the biggest problem we have in getting them out there, young men, is the parents who don't want them to come to a place that has a need like our city has. What did Jesus do? Did he, did, he, did he hang on? And I'll have to take the Greek text here to help us out. But in Philippians, let this mind, or listen carefully, let this mind, this attitude, this mentality, let this way of thinking be in you, which was in Jesus Christ. Now, how did he think, all right? Well, Paul tells us, that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, even though he was God. Now, that doesn't make sense in the English. The idea is to seize something forcibly and take it for yourself. Instead of hanging on to his deity, that is to the prerogatives of deity, instead of hanging on to his heavenly wealth, instead of hanging on to his heavenly glory, instead of hanging on to all that he could rightfully have as the Son of God in heaven, he abandoned it. For most Christians, that was a stupid and foolish thing to do. You don't leave home with no promise of the future except poverty and a hard life. Help me. Help me. Where's the missions program of the church going to be? Tell me about it. Where are we going to get preachers for pulpits? Hundreds of them across the country that are vacant and empty and nobody wants to go. We're hanging on to our wealth, our security. Why did God give us our lives? To hang on to them? He thought it not robbery. He didn't think it a matter, a matter of seizure of property to be his equality of God with God. But he made himself of no reputation. What are they going to think about my kid? If he does, if he goes into Christian ministry, and by the way, you can go into Christian ministry in lots of fields of endeavor. They don't have to be in a pulpit. But he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a slave. My kid's not going there. My kid's not. My kid's going to get a college education. He's going to have a secure future and a retirement. And if he's ever, ever a missionary, he's never going to have the retirement he needs. My high school advisor told me, why do you want to go into the ministry? There's, there's no money in that. He surely was right about that. <laughs> and I have a wealth today that I would not trade for all the money in the world. I'm at the end of the process. Lived on the edge of financial disaster most of my life. And I'll tell you about a great God who miraculously provides 
I'll tell you about him. Took upon him the form of a slave, was made in the likeness of men, being found in his fashion as a man. He humbled, literally humiliated himself, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Turn, turn to Mark 8, if you will, please, quickly. Let's, let's move along quickly. Turn to Mark 8. What is the reason for your personal existence? And you must answer the question, what am I going to do with my life? And in Mark 8, verse number 34, the words of the Lord Jesus. When he had called the people unto him, that's Mark 8, 34. When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whoever will come after me, whoever will follow behind me, now that word will is important. The English doesn't do justice for some of these, even in the better translations. The word will is the Greek word desire. Anyone who desires in his heart is the idea, it's the concept here. The word will means exercise your will but out of heart desire. Whoever desires in his heart to follow after me. So I have a question to you. Do you desire in your heart today to follow after Jesus Christ? All right? Now there's a formula here. If you're going to do it, you have to be like Jesus. Jesus was not about the American dream. And I say this because the, the, the evangelical and the fundamentalist churches are caught up in the American dream today. Money is a wonderful servant. It's a cruel God. And when you worship it, you lose it. And we'll find that out in just a minute. We're not going to hang on to what we've got in America today. It's gone because we worship it. We're too attached to it. We're not willing to let it go. It's not that we've got to let it go and not be careful in managing. It's the fact that we worship it too much. Too much. Whoever desires to follow after me, let him do three things. Number one, deny himself. That is, say no to himself. Say no to what he wants personally. It's what God wants that matters in my life. It's not what I want. Can you look this way for just a moment? My life is not about me. My life is about God. You ought to write that down. My life is not about me. My life is about God. Let him say no to himself. Now, it doesn't mean you don't work hard. It doesn't mean you never eat a steak. It doesn't mean you don't live in a nice house. It means that the purpose of your life is not governed by what you want, but by what God wants. So, deny himself. Number two, take up his cross. Take up his cross. Oh, me, I've got this terrible burden. This is my... No, that's not your cross. The cross is a place where sin is judged and punished. And in this case, not in an atoning way, but your, your, your willingness, as I said in the service this morning, your willingness to suffer for the sins of other, because of the sins of other people. I should not say for, but because of the sins of other people. That will, that will, that will determine the limits of your ministry in their lives. When you're working in these 12-step programs, we used to have Alcoholics Anonymous. Now we got, we've got sexual addicts. We've got these kinds of act, uh, We've got internet addicts. We've got pornography addicts. We've got all kinds of 12-step programs now. And you work with these troubled people, and you pay a price to work with them, or you won't work with them. Working with troubled people is trouble, whether it's a church level or it's individual. Am I right about that? Well, if you're going to follow Jesus, say no to yourself. Take up your cross. That means a willingness to suffer because of the sins of others. You can't atone for their sins, but you will suffer because of their sins. Pastors have to do this all the time, and it drives them crazy. Why do I have to go through this? Well, simply because you can't minister without suffering because of the sins of other people. It, 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 it won't happen. It will not happen. So we need to get over the persecution complex in ministry. <laughs> Hello. 
Hello? Hello? And just suffer with the Lord. Does Jesus suffer because of our stupidity and foolishness and waywardness? What did he suffer on the cross for us? If he took our attitude toward ministry, none of us would be here tonight, this, this afternoon. Correct? Am I right? No, no, no one of us would be here if he took our approach to life. Come on, say amen. amen. Confession's good for the soul, even if you're a Baptist. <laughs> so, so uh, none of this matters. And so he says, take up his cross and then follow after me. Now, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's just a little lesson. Now, this is interesting. These translators, they, what they do is to take the same Greek word and then they, they decide they're going to use a different English word for it, which is legitimate, but it depends on the context. And, and I don't believe that the, uh, I don't believe that the uh, right, translators, any of them were inspired. The original writers were inspired. But I want you to notice in verse 35, it talks about saving your life and losing your life. I'm trying to get my pocket undone here. Okay, I want to get my billfold out. All right, I'm going to give you a little object lesson here. Notice, if you try to save your life, verse 35, you what? What do you do? You lose it. And if you lose your life for his sake and the gospels, you do what? save it. But then they take that word life, and it's the Greek word suke, and it can be translated either soul or life, but we're in the same context. And it ought to read life every time here, because Jesus is talking about what you're going to do with your life, and trading your life away. Okay? You have a life. You have to do something with it. Yes? You have years of life. You have, you have all of the uh, material benefits of life. What are you going to do with, with, with your material things, with your bank accounts? What are you going to do with your time and your strength and your effort and your energy and your relationships? That's life, okay? What are you going to do with that? So what shall it profit a man? And then he says, you lose your own soul. That's your life. You lose your life. In other words, in other words all of the money you invest is gone. The investment firm goes belly up, and you've got nothing left. You've invested a whole life in this thing. Your whole life you're going to invest in this thing. When you get done, you're going to have nothing. That's what he's talking about. What shall a man give in exchange for his life? L-I-F-E. Suke. is suke. Same word as word life in the previous verse. What are you doing with your... Why did God give you your... Why do you exist? Why did he give you your personal existence? Why do you have the life? You have a world that you influence. I talked about that this morning. You and I had, don't have any earthly idea of the impact of our lives. And that will never be known until hundreds of years are gone by if Jesus tarries. You have no earthly idea what God is doing with your life. If you think God is doing through your life what you see and know, please, please, may I disabuse you of that. Your life has a value that you can't comprehend. God does not create junk. He doesn't have dollar stores. Okay? I mean, we, we've got to get our thinking straightened out as believers. If our thinking doesn't get straightened out, our living doesn't get straightened out. And our decisions don't get straightened out. And the reason we have so many problems is we're so much wrapped up in ourselves. And the more we're wrapped up in ourselves, the more counseling services we need from the church. Hear me. This culture that feeds on itself and feeds on itself and feeds on itself. My life is not about me, it's about God. My trials are not about me, they're about God. My resources are not about me, they're about God. God has given them to me for divine purpose. It's all about God. To lose means just absolutely, it disintegrates everything. By the way, everything sin touches disintegrates. We Christians, we don't have that figured out. We think we can live in a pagan world and a pagan nature, nation that, that, that decries the thing that, 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 that stands against the things of God. And we think we can still have our freedoms and enjoy the blessings of liberty in our country. Listen. Everything that sin touches disintegrates. Period. Without exception and without fail.
And he talks about lose his own soul means to have it taken away or to forfeit it. To have it taken away or to forfeit it. A couple of things here. A couple of things here. See if I can find somebody's picture here. Okay. All right. I have a picture. Who is this fella? Ah, yes. His name is on the street over here. Jackson. Jackson Street's right over here. Okay. All right. I got a picture of Jackson, Andrew Jackson here. Okay. Now I want to ask you a question. Of what is this made? Two things. Paper and ink. Okay. Paper and ink, and that's a loaded question. You all get an F. <laughs> all right. Now, you're, you're still awake, and you can think a little bit at this hour of the afternoon. Have you stand to do jumping jacks? All right. Now, this is not made of paper and ink. This is made of L-I-F-E. This is made of life. Now, hear me. I gave a portion of my life away for my paycheck that I will never get back again. I died. This, this represents a portion of my life that, that, that's gone forever. It's gone forever. Is that true? What you are living for you are dying for. This is the means by which we trade away our lives. Am I coming through? This is the means of exchange. We, we trade away our lives for whatever we do with this. It's made of life. And what you are living for, you are dying for. And if what you're dying for is not worth living for, wow. Wow. You think about that. Think about that. Think about your offerings this afternoon and this morning. You didn't give God money in the offering. You gave a part of your life to God in that offering. That makes it sacred. Yes. Yes. That's not money. That's life. What you did when you put your life in the offering this morning is you placed your life in, are you listening to me? You placed your life in the ministry of the gospel. What a privilege. You didn't pay a bill. Paying your tithe is not paying a bill. Paying a tithe is what you're doing with your life. Why did God give you your life? To keep it or to give it away? And when we say give it away, I don't mean stupidly and foolishly. Everybody would like to take it that you know, take it from you for their own selfish ends. You're a steward of your life. You're a steward of your finances. You're a steward of your time, your resources, strength. You're a steward. You're, you're simply a manager of a God-made person with God -given, a God-given world of resources. So, Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, and here, here, anybody here plants seeds? This is the thing. I was a farm boy, but most people have never planted anything. But on the farm, if you, if you eat bread, somebody planted wheat. They put, they put a seed into the ground, and that, ground, that seed absorbed moisture, and, and it corrupted and died, and out of it came a stalk, and on the top of it, instead of one grain of wheat, there were probably 20 grains of wheat or whatever is in, in the head of that wheat stalk. Okay? 
So Jesus said, if you hang on to your life, you lose it. You give it away, and we're not talking about stupidity and foolishness now. You do understand that. You give it away, you invest it wisely, and you keep it. Now, here's the end of this story. You only, at the end of life now, you only get to keep what you give away. Okay? When it's all over, you only get to keep what you give away. And I want to challenge everybody here, and not in the stupid way, I mean a very sane and sensible way, very loving and kind and intelligent way, give your life away, because that's why God gave it to you. He didn't give it to you to keep. He gave it to you to give away. And I can tell you from experience, the people that give their lives away are the richest, fullest people on planet Earth. God does not deprive you and bring you to poverty. Giving your life away does not bring you to poverty. It brings you into the richest, the richest life you can live. And when you get done with it, God's investment firm is not going out of business. There's not going to be a run on the market and a collapse of the currency. Will not be. It has eternal value. I will never forget. I will never forget. Anybody here, uh, I have friends in different countries of the world. I will never forget going to a funeral in Japan. We have a missionary lady that was there for many years and died there in ministry. <coughs> and in Japan, it's required that you have cremation. Cremation is the, is the, uh, is the way that you deal with, with, with burial in, that, in Japan. So this dear lady was cremated. We went to the crematorium, took the casket and the coach, the funeral coach, and, and we went into this large hall, had all of these doors that went into the area where the, there was the fire and the heat, the furnace. And so they opened one of them up and then the casket went on through the door and the door closed. And then the family went on upstairs. We all went upstairs for an hour and a half, two hours. And then we came on down after the cremation had taken place. And then the pallet on which it was a stainless steel pallet on which the coffin and everything was there came on out of that same opening. And all there were, all that was left, all that was left were the larger bones and ashes. That was all that was left. And I looked at that and I said, wow, if she wasn't a Christian, are you listening? If she hadn't invested her life in the gospel, at the end of life, this would be all that's left. Whew. Wow. Wow. But she had a treasure laid up in heaven that was unbelievable. Unbelievable. So may the Lord encourage you these days. May he give you wisdom. And may we not be so enamored with the age in which we live and its technology and all of its wealth and riches and, 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 and all. You go to a restaurant and it takes you an hour to go through the menu. I mean, we're like cats drowning in cream. If anybody knows about cats. And so may, 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 may God give us wisdom to take, to gather up all of our resources, dedicate them to the plans and the purposes of God, and just say, God, it's all yours. I don't want to blow it, I don't want to throw it away on useless things. I want to manage it. Manage it for your glory. And it doesn't mean you don't increase wealth. But I'm asking you, why are you increasing it? What's your goal? What you got in mind? Kingdom of God? Personal enhancement? 
what, what's going on in our lives? Because our lives are all about God. He's a great God, a wonderful God. And his love for us, oh, who can explain it? Who can explain it? May the Lord bless you. May he give you his joy. Be faithful to the trust he's given you. Well, let me just uh, read to you the benediction that I think is very appropriate for us today. Romans eleven thirty three and following. Oh, the deeps of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed again to him. For of him and through him and into him all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.